Welcome. I'm Chloe Russell Chang. I'm the Education Associate at Textile Center. Thank you all so much for coming to uh, join us for the Art Speaks Tish Murphy talk from hook to book. We're so excited to have Tish in our space today. We're huge fans of rock hooking at Textile Center. We have plenty of classes continually on our class roster for rug hooking. People are super enthusiastic about it. And today we get to learn about the fabulous portraiture practice that Tish employs in her rug hooking process, which is detailed in her new book, Hooking Faces. Um, very, easy to, very easy to find online. <laughs> it's also available in our shop. I believe we're sold out at the moment, but more books are on the way. So if you purchase one or if you're looking to purchase one, Tish will sign it for you today. So it's a super fun opportunity. Um, and so with that, I will leave it over to Tish. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, you can thank ask you all for being here, among <laughs> which are family members that keep sneaking in the door. One from, <laughs> one from Winnipeg, one from Duluth. I'm So this is very, very, very special. And I know so many of you and I've met some new people. So it's just wonderful. We're here to talk about rug hooking and hooking faces specifically, but I want to begin with a brief reference to the origins of rug hooking, then a quick fast forward through the last century or two of the craft, and that'll bring me to uh, my story as a rug hooker and to the book that brings us together today. Origins are imprecise. The technique of having a raised surface, an upper layer of fibers attached to a foundation fabric is known to have occurred as far back as ancient times. However, to keep the focus on the hooked rug versus woven or knotted, we'll start at a point in time between the 9th to the 13th centuries. During that time, Viking adventurers routinely raided and marauded uh, colonized parts of northern and western coasts of Scotland. It's just 200 miles from Norway to the Orkney Islands in the north of Scotland. Uh, they brought their own marks of civilization, including a fiber technique very similar to rug hooking. And over time, those skills spread through the British Isles. They brought other notable things as well. My Scottish grandmother's potato scones are very, very similar to Lefse, which so many, <laughs> so many of you know. So they spread a lot of, the, of their uh, talents and skills. The ethos of early rugs still permeates the art of rug hooking today in its technique and in its purpose and in its textural appeal. Here we have the marauding. <laughs> we have the marauding Vikings. <laughs> um, so yes, the right. It's such a simple technique. It's just narrow strips of cloth drawn through a ground fabric. Precursors of the hooked rug can be seen in bed rugs and hearth rugs that were very common to Scotland and England in the 17th and 18th century, but some can be traced to 18th century America. This is an example from the early 18th century in America. And then we have one that's from around 1772. By the late 18th and early 19th centuries, the hooked rug could be found in colonial America along the Eastern seaboard and the Atlantic provinces of Canada. The earliest of these new rugs were born out of necessity. Floor coverings were either non-existent or beyond the means of early settlers. This floral primitive is from about 1825 and was found in Maine. It is known as the Cape May Primitive. And it was preserved by a, a man called Ralph Burnham, who was a collector and in the 19, late 19th century, he formed a business in Ipswich, Massachusetts that was totally dedicated to the preservation and the repair of antique rugs. We really owe a lot to him. He, he so many of the very early rugs that we see 
photographs of and which there are now reproduced patterns of are really thanks to him. Um, I have a, this is a, a version of that rug that was hooked in uh, 19, in yes, 1981. Very different colors than it would have been in May, but um, so those rugs persist largely thanks to Ralph Vernon. And here was a, a book that was written about him uh, in 1925. It would be really fun to uh, to look at one of those books if if we could find one. Um, to create the early hooked rugs, fabric strips were cut or torn from rags and scraps. And that, at that time, the foundation would have been burlap or very rough homespun homespun cloth. The skill itself was passed from mother to daughter, and from neighbor to neighbor. The designs were simple, mostly inspired by the maker's surroundings. Typical motifs were flowers, animals, flags, simple geometrics. Sometimes embroidery designs or quilts served as an inspiration. The use of these motifs has really never gone away. They've just changed according to the styles of the times, materials available, and the sophistication of the designer. One thing about um, all of these early rugs that we really treasure and that we take so much inspiration from is that we don't really know the names of the makers. So uh, most of them are anonymous. By the mid to late, teen, late 19th century, a new type of cottage industry sprang up, the production of printed patterns. One of the most well-known and in influential of this new industry was Edward Sands Frost of Maine. This is a frost pattern from around 1870. And here we have another of his patterns um, from about 1890, but the image on the right is a later interpretation of it. Frost not only created stencils to make patterns more efficiently, he even created a better version of the hook. And by 1887, rug hooking patterns were available through the Montgomery Ward catalog, <laughs> bringing the patterns to more parts of the country. Many of these patterns were in full color to guide the maker with color schemes. One other development that fueled the expansion of rug hooking occurred after the Civil War. Wainwright Cushing, a wool dyer, made dyes available in small packets for the home consumer. It became a successful mail order business and Cushing's Perfection dyes remain a favorite of rugs today. I use them. I use, there, there are other types of dyes now that a lot of hookers use, but I still use the, the Cushing dyes. The availability of, of patterns might have stifled some of the spontaneity and originality of the early designs, but on the other hand, it brought about widespread practice of the craft. Even today, the full kit or pattern remains a staple of the rug hooking community, but it is only one aspect of the art. The individual creativity of the maker or artist has never ceased to be the major influence in, and the driving force in the rug hooking community. These are three examples from the late 19th century. Again, makers unknown, um, but they also indicate some of the common themes of that time, floral and geometrics. Rug hooking continued in this way, a legitimate option for the thrifty homemaker for decades right through the arts and crafts movement of the early 20th century. After the First World War, commercially made floor coverings became more economical and available to most households, and the world had changed. The handcraft movement declined. <clears throat> but even as the popularity of homemade objects ebbed, a couple of brilliant entrepreneurs were laying the groundwork for the expansion of rug hooking in the 20th century. 
through trained teachers, more sophisticated patterns, and primers on the principles of color. A titan among these was Pearl McGonagall. In addition to being a prolific designer of rug hooking patterns, she was a color expert and an author. Her books helped to authenticate and elevate the craft. This is a, a, a Pearl McGowan book. I think she wrote five books that are, they're real treasures. Um, and she was active from 1930s through the 1960s. On the screen, you'll see on the left, one of her patterns that was adapted from a cruel design and of course her book. And then um, on the right, a pattern that incorporates scrolls. Now she was a big proponent of scrolls, <laughs> of finely shaded scrolls. Um, and she really felt that that was a sign of the very skilled, successful hooker. And I have a disclaimer here. I've never hooked a scroll. <laughs> um, <clears throat> perhaps her greatest contribution was to develop training workshops and a certification process for teachers of, of the craft of rug hooking. <clears throat> this network of programs exists to this day and is more common now for the skill to be learned in a small class taught by an enthusiastic teacher than by a family member passing down generational knowledge. Other national guilds and publications and workshops soon followed. Joan Moshimer, a protege of McGowan, picked up where McGowan left off. She was a productive designer and a tireless teacher she also became the owner of the W. Cushing Company. Remember Wainwright Cushing dies? And she ran it successfully for over 50 years. She widely expanded the product lines and established its position as a go-to source for everything rug, everything rug looking. It's still going strong under the ownership of Lisanne and Ron Miller. These are a couple of Moshimer patterns from the 60s and 70s. They're a bit looser in style. And in this case, I think that the palette is a very 1960s or 70s palette. <laughs> Rug hooking continued to grow and to encompass a full range of expression from the passionate hooker who works from a pattern to the respected artisan whose originality creates museum worthy pieces of art. Here's a small sampling of pieces from the 19, late, mid to late um, 20th century, which is when I became involved in rug hooking. This first one is a 1968 piece by a woman called Doris Eaton. Um, she actually was born in the US, but she lived most of all of her adult life in Nova Scotia. And she just had spectacular originality. Um, she had begun a rug hooking group when she was a young married woman and found that she needed an outlet. She had quite a few children, maybe four or five. So she uh, developed a little group in Nova Scotia and uh, and she pursued her craft that way. I actually, I have a, a, a book here that you can look at. Her work is just fabulous. And um, she was she was an amazing hooker. <clears throat> the next piece is um, done by another Canadian, Nancy Edel. Um, she was a very, very bold and experimental hooker. And she, her compositions were very complex. She used a lot of mixed media, introducing oil painting and incised wood uh, attached to her hooked pieces. Um, and I actually have a catalog of hers from um, from the, I think it was just around 2000, 2004. And um, she had a, an exhibition at the Winnipeg Art Gallery. And uh, you can look at her work. It's really, again, spectacular work. And then finally, a lovely, quietly elegant piece by a, a hooker called Emma Tennant. And this was done in the late 1990s. Um, 
and she interprets her ageless surroundings in the Scottish border country where she lives. I was introduced to the rugby cooking world in the early 1980s through a quirk of fate and through the portal of antique rugs. At that time in Providence, Rhode Island, I was working as a housekeeper in an elegant historic home. I'm Canadian and I was in this country illegally, so <laughs> I was unable to apply for jobs. Um, <clears throat> And wonderful Mrs. O'Donnell, when I went to apply for the job as housekeeper, she listened to my story and then she said, oh my, what have you got yourself in <laughs> But um, casually scattered throughout her very, very lovely home were antique cooked rugs. And the artist in me was immediately captivated. I was very confident that I could learn this skill on my own. But I, at the same time, was completely ignorant of the fact that I was living like in rug hooking Mecca. I was on the East Coast and I had, I had no idea. This was pre-internet, you didn't know these things. So it was, anyway, I, I discovered a, a resource to get the materials to learn how to hook. Uh, from a catalog called the Braid Aid Catalog. Uh, they had originally at, uh, started their business in the 1940s for the rug grader, but then they later added materials for rug hookers. Um, so I placed a large order, among which was one small kit with instructions. And that was my rug hooking training. And Pearl McGowan would again be horrified. <laughs> that was it. That was my training. <clears throat> For several years, my own first attempts subscribed to typical subject matter and style. These are two cushions that I did in the 80s and 90s. Um, and then this was a half circle Christmas rug that I did in 89. Uh, and here was a a simple rug doing something that many, many rug hookers do. I was using up all the extra strips that I had left over. <clears throat> By the mid 1990s, I had ventured into making kits of small, sweet designs that were sold through a catalog. I've always liked the presence of the human figure in a cooked piece. I like the way that it tells a story or it lets the viewer create their own story. Um, on either side here, we have two small six by nine pieces that hang on the wall, but I also did the same similar figures on a pair of mittens. This was also when I chose to book a couple of faces, angels among others, and mostly by trial and error, I developed skills in this area and found approaches or techniques and a few tricks that could be relied upon to get the results that I wanted. By the late 1990s, I started to teach the hooking of faces. At least in this part of the country, there seemed to be a gap when it came to this small niche in the rug hooking pantheon. Part of my motivation to pursue the art of hooking faces was my alarm at seeing lovely rugs, often story rugs, that were marred by awkward treatment of the faces or figures. The, the story rug is quite a trope in the rug hooking world. It's the recording of a family event or family history, but because it's often a large rug, the figures are quite small and the faces even smaller. And it's really surprising to me the number of times that I've seen such a rug where the only thing I can see is a small, grotesque face. <laughs> and it's, so <laughs> even, if even if it's just one little part of the rug, you want to basically get it right. <laughs> um, te help, teaching helped me to further codify the principles that could be applied to hooking a face in any style and at any scale. 
we have here a tea cozy that I did, I think still in, in the 1990s. Um, I developed formulas for dyeing a range of flesh tones. A, a really important concept is that to develop the swatches that you need for hooking a face, it's not just one formula of which you dye, from which you dye a range of values. Um, it's more than that. You want related swatches, but not, not all the same because you want to get shadows that have different colors in them. Deep shadows, which are greens and blues and, and purples. I had, um, I had a student um, come to me early on with an example of a face that she had hooked of her mother. And it was really, she'd done it beautifully. It was a lovely face. It looked like her mother, but she had just taken one formula and dyed about eight or 10 swatches that she used to hook the face. So there was no modeling. There was no variation that would really show the, the, um, the contours and the modeling of the face. Um, so that's why I've, um, you have to dry, dye the swatches in this way. I have, I have lots of different swatches here as an example for different flesh tones and the, the pieces that you use for the really deep swatches. Um, <clears throat> so that helped a lot once, once I had done that. And here are panels on a bag that I made. Again, the figure. I really like hooking the figure. My series of St. Nicholas patterns became a way for students to ease into hooking a face. There is much less invested in hooking a character than hooking the portrait of a known person. And this isn't even a whole face. It's uh, so much is obscured by beard <laughs> and mustache, but it's an opportunity to practice some of the principles I've detailed in my book. <clears throat> for several years before the pandemic, I had toyed with the idea of putting my accumulated knowledge into a book, something straightforward, just I wanted a how-to. My teaching days were coming to an end, the stress of guiding 12 students at a time through the process of hooking a creditable likeness was becoming too much. I've got many students in, <laughs> in this group right now that, that have been part of, part of those groups. Um, I worried so much. I would, you know, in the four or five days of the class, I would lie awake every night. And in my brain, I would go around the class over and over again, thinking of every person and what they were working on and what I could do to help their piece be successful. Um, actually, one such night that I was doing this, of course, I couldn't sleep. I thought, well, I'll just get up and have a cup of coffee and go out into the rug hooking with a big rug hooking classroom. And I may as well do that. So I did. But as I left the room, I heard the door lock behind me. So I was locked out of my room. And this was about three o'clock in the morning. I went into the big rug hooking classroom. It was very cold. Um, so I thought, hmm, well, there are tables and tables of heaps of wool. And I thought, well, I'll just get underneath all the heaps of wool. So I managed to do that. I lay on the table and covered myself up with wool. But then I thought, well, what if somebody gets up and comes in here and I rise up? <laughs> so, so I didn't think that was a very good idea. And I got out from under the table of wool, but I found a sweater that somebody had left on their chair. So I, so I was fine. Uh, and, you know, I'd gone through more than one episode of tears, as well as a rather frightening threat by one very frustrated student that she was going to murder me. <laughs> it was none of you. <laughs> so the pandemic was the perfect opportunity to do the groundwork that became the, hook, the, the book, Hooking Faces. My emphasis in the book is on the basics, just some tried and true methods that can help the hooker achieve satisfactory results. I want 
hooking a face just to be another tool in the rug hooker's toolbox. I include several series of photos with descriptions that follow the entire process from making a good pattern and then following a fairly reliable sequence of hooking the face. This is of my granddaughter Maeve when she was about 18 months old. Um, another thing that I do in the book is that I talk about, and, and here you can see I've circled uh, at least one of the pictures, I try to talk about the adjustments that I make as I'm going along, because when you're hooking a face, one of the things that you'll find that as you get more and more parts of the face, of the face hooked, that really informs perhaps what has gone before, and it shows you what you might need to adjust. So that's a critical part of, of doing the face. I introduce the reader to the principles that I think are essential to hook a reasonable portrait. I call them Murphy's Laws. And, <laughs> and some of the most important ones are to put the features in the right place. And if the, field is, if the face is tilted at an angle, um, to have all the features at the same angle. I, I can't tell you how, how many times I've seen a, a face hooked <clears throat> very nicely. And perhaps the nose and the mouth are both at the same the correct angle, but the eyes will be looking <laughs> straight up. And the funny thing is that with some of these things, um, to the person that isn't uh, a portrait artist, which which I am, which I was early in my life, they may know that something is not quite right, but it's very can be diff very difficult for the novice to figure out just what exactly it is that that's not correct. So that's I try to show people in this way to have things at the same angle if the face is tilted. Another thing to do is to pay attention to the relationship between features. All of these little relationships are what makes a face unique. So that if you're doing a portrait of a particular person, the space between the nose, tip of the nose and the lip, or between the eyes or from the eye over to the side of the face, those are all very specific measurements that make the, that particular face what it is. Another is to use the wide range of values, as I talked about earlier. It's the difference between light values and dark values that create volume and contour in the face. And then the direction of the hooked rows matter. You want the rows, the hooked rows, to follow the contours of the face. A cheek is somewhat round. You want a little bit that you want the row to be following uh, the curve of that cheek. Uh, the forehead is more horizontal. You want the rows of the hooking to be fairly horizontal. Um, I had a student come to me once who'd hooked a very lovely face. Um, but she, she knew something was not right. And again, she just couldn't discern what it was. Well, the problem was in the forehead. She, uh, this in this particular photo that she was working from, there was a very strong highlight in the middle of the forehead, which is very common. You get a highlight in the forehead or on the bridge of the nose. She had hooked this highlight in a circle on the forehead. So it looked like a medallion. <laughs> and um, so it was a very easy fix. You know, I we just we just took that out. And even though and, and made sure that she continued, she'd hook in horizontal in one flesh tone and then change it to the lighter, but still in the horizontal. And of course, it made all the difference in the world. Another thing is to keep moving. Don't get stuck on one feature. Um, this is very early in the sequence of hooking my grandson's picked portrait when he was young. And he's right back there, much older now. <laughs> um, but when you've only got one 
little area done in your cooking, it takes on huge importance. And it's it's quite common for people to get completely stuck on that one feature and to keep redoing it and saying, oh, I don't think it's quite right. And they redo it again and again. They can be on it for a day or two days. Um, so I tell my students, get it mostly right. Get it in the right position. Have it, you know, basically the way you want it to look. And as you get other parts of the face done and filled in, that will inform what you may have to do to adjust it. Another thing that I advise people is to take photos as you go along and, and look at the photo uh, on your computer, because when you see a small version of the face that you've been working on, it's amazing um, what might pop out at you in terms of what needs some adjustment or isn't working right. Another option is to use a reducing glass, um, which you can hold over your hook it and it reduces it down to a very small size. And again, you're able to see it as a whole and, and make some, some good decisions about it. Also in the book, I talk about the different styles of a hooked face, those that are most commonly found in rug hooking. And I, I divided it into four categories. The first is the purely realistic, uh, style of hooking a face. In this kind of, a, in this style, the realistic, the features are really faithfully accurate in size and in relationship to each other. A wide range of values is used to create the, the facial contours, and it really requires meticulous observation of all the things that I've talked about, you know, relationships between features, especially. The realistic simplified, um, again, you want um, verity in terms of where the features are and their relationship to each other, but the palette is much more limited. And then a caricature, usually there's some exaggeration of features or proportions. And again, the palette is very limited. These are so fun and freeing to do. You can just, you can really play when you're doing a caricature. The feature list, which I, I think that I uh, touched upon earlier when I was talking about story rugs, is a staple in rug hooking where just the suggestion of a face is sufficient. Um, in the story rug on the left, that was done by Kathleen Limbaugh um, about 10 or 15 years ago. So here, that's she and her sisters in the in 1957, and you just need the suggestion of the face. And then I've done a larger example to see how you might do that. It just takes two or three different uh, values to make that kind of a face. So you know, actually, the principles that I've talked about in the book are applicable to creating a likeness in in any medium from you know, from doing a portrait in oils to um, seed art at the state fair. So uh, I, I think that, again, one of the reasons uh, that hooking faces has become a focus for me is that I really like a piece that tells a story. And that often requires the human presence in a rug. This is an address sign that I did for our house some, some years ago. Now, there's not a face in it, except for our little doggy's face. But um, but you see the people and it tells a story. That's my husband reading a book and I'm cooking a rug and the dog's just lying there wonderfully. Um, here we have Anne and Kenny, who was one of the leaders of the suffragette movement in Britain at the turn of the last century. And this is... Um, a rug that would be suitable in a guest room. It's a country friend welcoming a city friend, um, which is, is just kind of fun. Those faces are very small, um, but I think, I think that they relay the emotion that they're feeling. I go to the other extreme as well, hooking small face pins. I love doing these. And you know, 
usually I, I just hook them for fun. And so I have a number of different patterns that I just draw a little outline and then I hook the face. What I like about doing it is that I, when I sit down to do them, I say, I wonder who I'm going to meet today <laughs> because you just never know what the face will look like when it emerges. They're about two and a half by three to three and a half inches. However, when you do custom work, it's much more stressful. Um, and here we have, those are on the outside, those are face pins that I cooked, custom face pins, and then a, um, a tea coat that was a custom order. And what you don't, you know, like I might be surprised when I cook an ordinary face pin at Hulu, I'll, I'll be surprised by who I meet. Well, when you do a custom face pin, you never know what the response of the person is. Going to be. So, so I, I once had a woman say to me, well, my nose is that. <laughs> and, and I'm thinking, well, yeah, it is. <laughs> anyway, so here we are in 2023 and the art of rug hooking thrives. In our area, like in Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, we have many shops. We have many, many fabulous teachers, many of whom are here today. We have annual workshops that draw people from around the country. And we have hooking groups, like the one that meets here in the Textile Center on Tuesday mornings, which is really great. Um, and I, I just like to think that with this book, I've added my my own little footnote to the rug cooking story. And thank you so much for listening. So when you start looking at face, do you want to start in a um, process where like I will start with the cheese or whatever and I go just kind of order or yeah. it's just a very funny I do. I do have a, a a pretty predictable sequence in which I do it. I usually start with one eye and then do a little bit of the bridge of the nose and perhaps a little bit of the cheek. Then I do the other eye and a little bit more of that cheek and the nose. Um, perhaps even before that, I put just one little thin hooked line in for the mouth. It will be expanded upon later but I like to see where everything's going to be in relation to each other. And then as I fill in the rest of the face, uh, I just make it all work and make any adjustments and tweaks that I have to do. The formulas for the dye colors, are those beautiful? Some of them are, yes. Yeah. What size strip do you usually use? Um, the size strip, I usually use fours and fives for the faces. Yeah. And, and then I also um, often hand cut very, very thin strips, which I squeeze in, and also even threads that I've pulled out of wool fabric to make... Um, to make really to make the features pop and to delineate them a little bit more clearly yeah but those go in after the fact they don't go in while you're hooking because they just get pulled out again yes mary um so you make a lot of faces and you see a lot of people with a lot of faces do you have a thing that you can have you noticed that people have the most trouble with one particular you know, I think the thing that most people have trouble with is that it takes a different kind of looking, a different kind of seeing to hook a face. You, you have to be so attuned to those relationships, to an angle, um, and you have to remove from your brain preconceived notions that, oh, an eye looks like this, a mouth looks like this. Forget it. Just look look at angles and relationships. That That's the most difficult thing. Yes? For your little pens, what kinds of you use on that? I use a four cut, mm -hmm. but I also use a lot of tricks. And so I often cut 
strips down or um, if I hooked it and and one loop is sticking out, I just snip it out or uh, hand cut little tiny thin strips to squeeze in. But but they're mostly a four. Yes. You hope must be out of the time to do the face. It it's um it's one of the smaller hooks. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Can I just add one word? Yeah. <laughs> well, I just want to say I learned my kid everything, and I learned a lot. And I can't tell you how many times it started conversations with me. And it always started. My sister's a hooker in the end. <laughs> it starts like that. But I, I made friends over this thing. It really started so many times. Um, thank you. Oh, well, thank you, dear sister. <laughs> For the advertisement. What was your favorite medium in terms of batting? Uh, I just use I use monk's cloth for everything. Yes. <laughs> yes, Sam. So do you want to advertise the habit show? What? Oh yes. Would you would you like okay? Um I won't do as good a job as you would, but I did want to mention that in starting in January. Uh, will it be three months or four months at Plymouth Congregational Church? 1900 Nicollet. Pardon me? 1900 Nicollet Avenue. Oh, 1900 Nicollet Avenue. In the late 1940s and 50s, there was a wonderful African American artist by the name of Elizabeth Catlett. And she did, uh, she did a variety of medium, but she did uh, block prints. Uh, and she did uh, sculpture. So a woman in Ohio who has always loved her work um, got permission from the Smithsonian to use these 14 prints of the artist Elizabeth Catlett and have 14 rug bookers do interpretations of each of these prints. Wow. It's it's really a spectacular exhibit. It's spectacular. And Tish did one of them. I did one of them. <laughs> yes. I I did one of them. And um so it's come it, it's a traveling exhibit and it's coming to Plymouth Church in January. And so Maddie Frioli, the curator, will be there as well as Tish on yes. the seventh at 10 a.m. It was very it was wonderful to be part of that project. It's it's really quite powerful. 